Yes, so the good things about Denmark were the public transportation actually worked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a relatively peaceful country, although it was occupied, or had been occupied. What were the things that were, you mentioned that it was hard to get, or there were still shortages of? Um, I, you know, I'm not, not sure that I, oh, well, well, you know, a lot of the luxury items like silk stockings, oh. which didn't bother me, but if I could get them sent from, <coughs> from home, uh, they were, you know, really welcomed. And, um... What about perfume and lipstick and... Not so much. No? Um... I'm trying, I just, you know, I'm not... I'm, <coughs> funny, I don't remember. It's not important, but it's uh, interesting that you remembered that it was different. People were drinking... Coffee was still, still a luxury item, and so they mixed coffee with chicory. What's chicory? It's a root. Um, what is it like dandelion? It's I don't think it is, but it's it, it makes the when you roast it, it turns dark, and it's kind of bitter like coffee is, and you can grind it and blend it. And, and the the French use chicory still, in true French coffee, they oh. It it doesn't give you the caffeine boost, but. <coughs> so you're just drinking muddy water without any benefit of caffeine? <laughs> no, it's the social yeah. aspect of it. And the Danes do social eating. Uh, like, uh, afternoon coffee is with Danish pastries, of course. <laughs> and... Um, Breakfast is not usually a big meal, but in the middle of the morning they'll snack or eat. Second breakfast. And and then at lunch, and then dinner is late, often, oh. or was. I, I'm, I'm sure with, with the internet and with television and things that, that um, they've become much more three meals a day and no distractions, which is too bad. I don't know, gee. So when you got back to the United States, you went back to Berkeley after? Yeah. Uh, um, the second time. You know, second time, moved back into the apartment with Paul Frakes that we had, you know, for three or four years before that together. And um, went back to Cal. And that's when I realized that I was not really a scholar. <laughs> I would disagree, but okay. No, no, I'm a, I'm a pretty good student, and but I'm not a scholar in the academic sense that they want at university. The um, I mean, I love going to school, like learning, um, don't even mind writing the term papers and stuff like that too much, but. Um, I don't have the burning desire to do research and become the expert in why they changed the spelling of this to that in uh, 1542. You know, it just, <laughs> I don't know what happened in 1542, but anyway, I, um, and they, I got my master's degree and they took me aside and said, you know, you really we can't recommend that you go for the doctorate. And I said, uh, I know, <laughs> I understand. And, but I, I cut a deal with them that I would stay working for them as a, as a Scandinavian, but I would start taking education courses and English courses while I was there at Cal. So, um, <clears throat> Actually, I moved into the de Department of Education. Oh, okay. 
looking for a secondary education credential like high school and um, did most of my work there and then there was a real crush shortage of high school teachers and so before I got my credential um, the recruiters were coming all around and a couple of guys from um, Lemoore High School, Lemoore Union High School came up and interviewed me and asked me if I wanted to go to work. And I said yes. We need to back up though, because how did chemistry fit into all of this? Me? I never took chemistry. Yet you were working as a chemist of sorts. <laughs> in Were you not doing some recreational chemistry? I was a gopher. Okay. I carried the hose. I fetched and carried and, and went. Just like I was not a chemist at my brother's place. I. You're an assistant. Yeah, just carried things, moved things. Yeah, no, I was never a chemist. So what about the illicit activities that uh, went on with the hallucinogenic drugs? That was Paul. <laughs> um... And uh, he and his roommate Vladimir, not not his roommate, but his longtime friend Vlad, a Bulgarian of doubtful whatever. I mean, no, actually, Vlad was a descendant from nobility, but you never would have known it. <laughs> And um, anyway, they needed somebody to fetch and carry one year, and I needed money. But that was later. Oh, that was. After we, after I was married. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that was like during the college years. I mean, no. So, how was your first teaching job at Lemoore? For someone who had absolutely no idea how to teach, uh, it was really pretty wow. good. I, I keep telling myself, maybe I should have stayed there. <laughs> no, really. Um, 45 miles south of Fresno, southwest of Fresno. And um, at that time, there you were Portuguese dairy farmer, Anglo cotton rancher, or not much, you know. Yeah, you worked at the post office or the grocery store. Yeah, and um, Mexicans came through as, as migrant workers, but were not a big issue again. Aha, uh -huh. but, but when I got there, <clears throat> all of a sudden, and one of the reasons I got the job, I think, is that half the students suddenly were dependents from the Naval Air Station at Lee Moore. And that was, they, that changed the whole complexion. So now you had three distinct groups, Navy brats, Anglos, and Portuguese. Um, and remarkably got along very well all together. Navy kids were smart enough to know that if they screwed up, somebody came down really hard on their parents on the base. Yeah. And daddy got onto their set case and said, if you like it here, do that again. Don't do that again. If you do it again, we'll be in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And that actually happened. Oh, um, wow. That's a good way to keep kids in line. We don't get to threaten kids like that. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and things you... You know, I went in and they said, you know, um, everybody realizes, we all realize in, in the profession that, that if you're teaching English, 20 students is probably the ideal maximum to have in an English class. Huh? We, I'm sorry, but we're, you're going to have to have 24 because of the increase in population and we haven't got the room for... Yeah. And, how many are in a high school English class today? 35? Uh, yeah, 42. I don't even know. Yeah. 
and you actually had a chance to teach. Um, and this was also before the great youthful revolution of the early 60s, and students were there and behaved. I mean, actually sat and listened and raised their hand and said, sir and ma'am, and a lot of stuff I didn't agree with, but, <laughs> but uh, it was a good learning environment. The other thing, which I lament the passing, is that the vice principal who was in charge of discipline actually could do some disciplining. <laughs> I mean, not what, what they can't do anything. There's a lawsuit waiting for them, you know. Uh, Vance here was one of the homelier men you'll ever met. <laughs> um, vice principal, and when you said some, when you had a problem with a student in the classroom, you said, go to the vice principal's office. And he went. I mean, without being escorted, he went. And he got there, and he didn't come back right away laughing, which happened a lot with me when I was at Liberty and other places, you know, they just thought, oh, what a joke, you know. And if, um, If it was seemed, if it was deemed serious, you know, he had five days out of your classroom, and was picking up trash on the campus. Well, of course, that all changed when the rise of employee unions in the schools, and that was a picking up trash was a custodial job, and you can't have children doing unsupervised and you know improperly supervised custodial work. That's oh no no. So what, you know, what can you do? You send them home? Well, in the late 50s, mid 50s, most of the parents were still at home. One of the parents was still at home. So that was... So sending them home was a reasonable option back then because they were going to be supervised in yeah. some way. But yeah. later... If you're going to send a kid home for five days, they're just going to be on the streets. That's right. Right. You know, causing more trouble mm -hmm. for someone else. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's quite a conundrum of then how you discipline a student. Yeah. So I had two years there. The last year I was a swim coach, varsity swim coach. And... Uh, I was not necessarily a good technical coach in terms of and things were changing radically about how did you do the breaststroke and how did you do this because um, butterfly was then part of the breaststroke it was an optional overhand stroke oh. that you could do but you still had to use the oh. frog kick and they were just changing to make it a separate thing but you could still do it mm -hmm as long as you kept your feet moving like that. Huh. And, um, but I was a good tech, um, tactical coach. I mean, I could, I would look at the swimmers entered in, the, in an event and I would know who to put in from my team to get the maximum possible number of points. Maybe not win. But if we win the event, maybe, but but we would score a lot. And so, um, as I did when I was a swimmer, uh, you know, occasional firsts, <laughs> lots of seconds and thirds, just, you know, and picking up the edges. And we were co-champions in the league. Nice. And they wanted me to come back. But then I had a job offer to go to Grossmont. And where was Grossmont? Um, Grossmont College in Gross La Mesa. La Mesa. Grossmont, so, California. Southern California, La Mesa. Outside of San Diego. And you decided to go there? Yeah, I made a few bad judgments there. Um, 
And um, anything you want to share? No. Any advice for me Just, to yes, avoid? Don't, <laughs> do not go on weekend retreats it, for high school. If you're a faculty member, don't do it. As the chaperone? Yeah. Just don't get, go. They'll, it'll, there's, even though I thought I was behaving in an adult and proper manner, and the students were supposed to behave in an adult and proper manner, nothing sexual, you know. But, um, but it got a little out of control and... A little bit, you know, alcohol. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> so that lasted one year and was probably, you know, how, you know, what is Murphy's Law? You rise to the level of your competence. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, I probably would have been good at, at a community, could have stayed at the community college level for the rest of my life, just teaching English and getting along with. Um, and so then there was a, a long gap of stop waiting on tables, which actually I liked. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, restaurants didn't do real well, but. What years was this that you were waiting on tables? early 60s just before your sister was born so it had to be oh, like, in the 70s yeah late well, six early late 60s and uh well i want to talk to you about your about the the 60s about this about the civil rights era are you do you have enough energy to keep talking for a few minutes or do you want to take a break do you want to go lay down we can talk uh, later 60s in where was i Okay. You gotta realize that the huge difference between when I was at Cal and when I left Cal as a teacher was that <clears throat> even the teaching assistants wore neckties to work polished their shoes and it was very much the 1950-ish. When I came back to Berkeley, because I went to work for Kim, and um, when did I, what, what, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, there's a lapse there somewhere. Anyway, um, I was living in Berkeley um, when People's Park happened. And I mean, I, I, I've heard of it. Tell me what People's Park was. Oh, it was a vacant lot, essentially, about three blocks from my apartment on Telegraph. And um, all of the, oh, no, I wasn't there. That's right. I was, I was, um, but anyway. <clears throat> It became um, like a hippie, whatever. The counterculture just kind of took it over and said, "You know, we're going. It's it's municipal property. It's public property. Nobody's using it. We're going to use it." We people pitched tents and lived there. Uh, they had concerts there. Was all kinds of weird stuff going. Lots of dope. Uh, not that I don't. Never. I actually, I never did smoke dope. You know. And um, were there it, protests there? Oh yeah, and... protests and um, all you know, all kinds, all the kind of counter culture movement <clears throat> started there. And what had been when I was living with Paul on on Telegraph, <clears throat> the south side of campus was was kind of nerdy and quiet and and Telegraph Avenue was was quiet not heavily trafficked uh, <clears throat> the Masonic Club of the University was just up and around the corner on Shattuck and uh, you know it was still a 
what you think of a, like a nice Midwestern college campus kind of thing. And then it just kind of went crazy. And um, I was not on campus when a lot of that happened. That happened when I was in San Diego and before when we came back up and then we uh, stayed with Ken and Sarah for a while in San Francisco and then moved to um, Fourth Avenue in Alameda. Another strange place. This another place that's changed um, remarkably. We had we moved into Alameda and bought a quarter acre of land with a house on it, you know, for for, for something we could afford, and um, that's when Ken bought the house up the street, you know, where he, I guess he still has it. On eighth. On sixth. On sixth. Sixth at eight, yeah. And uh, so what did you think of the transformation of the campus? I mean, you were the kind of buttoned up 50s guy with the tie and the shine shoes. And then all of a sudden it's becoming, you know, I don't know, burn your bra at the People's Park and stuff. Yeah, like, but I wasn't there. So what was your perspective on like the civil rights movement? What did you witness? And like, how did you feel when about Martin Luther King and... Oh, I felt that that Mario Savio and Martin Luther King and uh, a, a lot of that. Mario Savio was in junior college with me. Marty Osavio? No, Mario Savio. Mario Savio? I don't know who he's... Big, he, a... he was a big student rebel leader. Oh. There, and um, all, you know, I felt that it was definitely time for change. And I didn't see any particular reason that teaching assistants should have to wear neckties and uh, some of the extremes they went to, of course, were, were barely legal. What do you, the extremes I mean, the protesters went to? No, the oh. clothes the teaching people wore. I mean, you kind of wondered. What do you mean? T-shirts with holes and tears and, oh. you know, just no sense of taste. <laughs> and uh, sartorial elegance on the faculty was a thing of the past, <laughs> unless you were 80 years old and still walking around. But um, it had changed. When I, was, when I went to Cal, it was still... Um, a university, it felt um, kind of like something Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland might have gone to, uh, <laughs> essentially, in a lot of ways. And in its funny way, it looked after the students. And there was Cowell Hospital up on the hill, up the hill of ways, and you could actually go there and be treated. And um, <clears throat> While it wasn't um, fraternity sorority driven, they were very, the Greeks were active, and well, maybe it was, you know, but uh, you know, and it's there was still like the the campus life, and Berkeley was still pretty much a campus town. And then all of a sudden it, it, it changed radically and I'm, uh, I was not there for the, for the change. I could tell you one of the things I'm really glad for that I wasn't there, that during the People's Park riots, uh, somebody was shot from the roof of my apartment building where we, we were no longer living there, but I was in Southern California and you know, it was up on the roof over my apartment, what had been my apartment. And, and shot one of the uh, protesters or a student? One of the protesters was shot. And um, that kind of caused people to think a little. Oh, did they die? I don't remember. Um, so were you... By, by then I was trying to get, 
I had more interesting things to do. I was going to sail back from Honolulu, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> that does sound good. So you, did you ever participate in any marches or... No. You never went to Washington, D.C.? No. I was a coward. <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, that was one thing. I was also very much aware that if my picture showed up in some context in a, in a march or something, that I would probably find myself unemployable in a lot of a lot of areas. Oh wow! And I mean, this was not uncommon. Um, looking back, when I was in Denmark the second time, this was as a graduate student. Um, I did a couple of things that I thought were, you know, like I had never seen the battleship Potemkin, the movie. Um, and it was being shown up at the Young Communists uh, meeting place. And so a lot of my friends and I, we all went up and we watched the Potemkin, and it was great. It's a good movie. And um, But just being part... Just having gone, gone there and participated in something. I'm sure it tagged, it tagged me for a while. I mean, suddenly I had acquaintances that I never knew. I mean, people came up, we got to be friends or acquaintances and walked around a lot. I'm sure they were bored. Like, you think they were following you, hoping you were going to do something? I think they were just making a very thorough check that I was not... I mean, a, a lot of people did go to Europe and convert to some kind of radical polit political stance. And I didn't want to be any part of that. I just wanted to be able to go to the damn movie. <laughs> And um, Northern Europe was notoriously liberal, you know. They, they, cons they, they considered our liberal Democratic Party at the time as being totally, totally right-wing, almost fascist. And the Republicans were far worse. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. So um, what kind of news, while you were... In Denmark, what were you hearing about what was going on in America? Oh, it was still uh, still the 50s, so it okay. was very plain. It was just very... You know, milk toast, vanilla. <laughs> huh. So when, when major events of the 60s, like the assassination of Martin Luther King, happened, yep. how did it feel... I mean, did you feel like that was something that happened far away and it really didn't involve you? Or did, were you caught up in emotion of, like, this is a huge moment in history? Or did it not feel like that at the time? Like, do you remember uh, hearing the news? Where were you at the time? Like, I can't remember. So obviously okay. that didn't. What about JFK? <clears throat> JFK, I was in a classroom in Lemoore. And um, Jack Ruby interrupted my class. Oh, damn it! <laughs> was he the principal or no, the? He was the assassin. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and um, it. Um, Yeah, my third period class, I just went to hell, and, and um, nobody knew what to make of it. I mean, I, things like that, I mean, they happened while I was... Uh, one morning I came to school, and all the, all the guys' parents, all the, the kids' parents out of the Naval Interstation were gone. Poof. All the planes were gone. It was the Bay of Pigs. All the naval air, they were all carrier pilots and people like that. So they were all off ready to go to war. And uh, Lemoore was the fifth largest naval air station in the world. Oh. So it was considerably. Uh, so when they left, I mean, you could hear the air sucking in and going, you know. And then a week later, everybody was back and it was pretty much back to normal. <clears throat> 
so sorry to go back to this, but how did you hear? He interrupted your class. Like, what happened? Was there, did somebody come into the room? Was there an announcement? Oh, we had did those you, little brown boxes on the wall. Like an intercom? Yeah. And so who, somebody came on and said the president's been shot? Mm-hmm. Really, I wouldn't think they would interrupt class. I would think they would, I mean, yeah, I didn't know. I don't know. So that's how you heard. You heard mm-hmm. over an intercom in the school. Yeah. Did you feel sadness? Was JFK somebody that you thought was going to? Oh, I was. I thought it was a, a terrible waste. Of course, I'm. I'm not a big fan of assassination as a political uh, tool, anyhow. But I think it was a big. Um, um, a waste. Now, if he had <clears throat> stayed in office and finished out the maximum amount of time, he may have been, it might have been a disappointment. Hmm. Um, it's one of those things you never know. Start out strong and, and where does he go? But um, it was so much better than what had gone before. Right, yeah. Who's been your, who do you think was the best example of a U.S. president in your lifetime? Somebody you thought was respectable and <clears throat> diplomatic and effective. Effective is probably not a good qualifier because it just depends on, obviously, the legislature that you have, whether you can actually get anything through. But So who, did, who do you think was a... It's... Oh, boy. Did you like Reagan, even though he was a Republican? Did you think he was a good guy? No. Um, I didn't care for him, no. And the fact that he was already losing his mind um, didn't, you know, I didn't know that. I mean, we, that was carefully hidden, but, but, um, Oh boy. Um, Jimmy Carter? Did you like Jimmy Carter at all? Jimmy Carter, I think, was a very good man, but not a good president. Ineffectual. Um, I still think he's a great human being. Yeah, I still teach in Sunday school at like 98 or however old he is. Works for Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, and, has builds houses and. Yeah, and shows us how to live rather than just talking about it. I don't know that, um, and if you, if you talk then about like people like uh, Lyndon Johnson and some, you know, maybe effective presidents, you know, rotten human beings. What was bad about Lyndon Johnson? Oh, sexually profligate. Uh, I mean, Johnson screwed more people than Kennedy ever did and more than Bill Clinton ever did. Uh, and it was a, you know, and more women. I mean, I don't know about the rest. And um, and he was married the whole time, presumably. Oh yeah, yeah, the same same person. But um, as far as I think Truman was probably the last <clears throat> who. It was a difficult period, end of the war, because the war ended while he was president. Not um, taking over from someone like like um, FDR, like Roosevelt. Following that is is uh, would be difficult under any circumstances. Because FDR was good. Oh, and he'd been around for. Eight, Four terms, three and a half terms. Oh yeah. And nobody knew much else than he was, and he, but but he was, he was a very effective president. He got a lot done. Uh, he had one of the ugliest wives in presidential history, but she was neat too. Wait, FDR did or FDR? Yeah. And um, <laughs> but she went her own way and did her own thing, and it was all good, pretty much. Um, but the transition from a wartime government economy and whatever 
to getting back on a peaceful in the peaceful direction, which still had Korea and other things going. Um, was um, he was probably one of the most effective since after in, in that this time. Um, Nixon, I, I think it was Nixon who said he wasn't going to draft anybody over 25. And so Scott and I had a drink in his basement to celebrate my 25th birthday. <laughs> Scott Hambly? Yeah. You and Scott Hambly. <laughs> he called me up and said, come on over, I've got some scotch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a long, that, that was a long afternoon, but... Um, <laughs> Listen to bluegrass and drink scotch. I mean, what? What's, that sounds like a wonderful way to celebrate. <laughs> and um, but maybe it's because I'm older and I've gotten less. Uh, I'm less easy to bamboozle, but I have not been overwhelmingly impressed by a lot of the people we've had lately in the, as president. Um, And, you know, I liked him well. I thought he made some serious efforts in the right direction. Um, I may be wrong. And um, the fact that he was seriously handicapped by opposition in Congress um, may be testimony to how good he really was that he actually got some stuff done. But I, I really can't think of anybody that I I'm going to have his picture on my wall and... <laughs> how are you feeling are you getting tired yeah I'm a little tired <laughs> all right let's stop and let you rest and uh